Right, everyone, welcome to uh, our second workshop of the semester. And like we did with the supercomputing workshop, these are things to kind of fill in the gaps that we don't get the opportunity to teach in, let's say, the summer course or during the Psi 808 course. Today is going to be an introduction to diffusion imaging. And as part of this, we're going to be using FSL's TBSS suite, which has been around for quite a while. There are other ways to analyze diffusion imaging data, but I think it provides a good foundation. Also, later on, you know, I sent out the instructions yesterday about installing TBSS and FSL. It may not work on everybody's computer, and I realize that. But today, as uh, an added bonus, let's say, there's this other application called neurodesk.org, which I've learned about recently, which should remove any of those difficulties trying to get like the paths correct, things like that. It's a container where it has everything you need in a single web browser, so you don't need to install anything. So I'm going to go through my slides first, give you the conceptual background of diffusion analysis and how we analyze it. And then you're free to use TBSS on your own computer if you were able to download it or on a computing cluster, whatever you want. For everybody else, though, I'm going to be demonstrating it through Neurodesk because it should work for everybody's computer, no matter the operating system. So you are a, a test case. I'm just putting that out there right now. It should work. It, it works fine on my computer. It's worked fine on other people's computers that I know of. And if it works, then this makes giving workshops much easier. And it has virtually every kind of neuromaging software you could want uh, on that. And again, all through a web browser. OK. Um, let me see here. <clears throat> Diffusion workshop, yes. So let me begin with introduction to diffusion analysis. I think most people here I already know. I don't think there are too many new faces here. Is everybody here for the supercomputer workshop too? It's not a prerequisite. I'm, I'm just curious. <clears throat> but just so you know, everything I'm going to talk about here, the modules for that are also on there as well. Apologies for those lines. Not sure why they're showing up there. Um, just a <clears throat> quick intro for anybody who may be new to this, uh, this, this workshop series. Maybe you're a first year graduate student. I am part of something called the Neuroimaging Initiative, or NII. And this is consulting for anybody who does neuroimaging. And as part of that, we do give workshops on things like you know, advanced fMRI analyses, structural analysis, and also diffusion analysis. So if you're collecting any data off of the scanner, you have questions about how to analyze it, set up an experiment, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, I, I believe Bennett has retired, if you knew him, just, just so you know. Uh, he does occasionally you know, still answer emails, but just technically I, I do think he has retired. But it's me, Mike Engstad, are primarily the ones providing consulting services. Okay, so I'm assuming uh, about everyone here that everyone has, you know, or they will analyze diffusion-weighted imaging data at some point. And maybe you have some DWI data that you haven't looked at yet. Now, the data that you get off the scanner here, I believe you can get it either raw, that hasn't been pre-processed at all. We can also give it to you where it has already had some, say, denoising applied to it and so on. Uh, you know, some of those, some people just prefer it like that so they don't have to worry about those additional pre-processing steps. But I will show you how you can start from the ground up if you want to begin like that. Uh, that being said, this is you know, geared towards beginners. The idea is we're going to start today with TBSS, which is a suite for diffusion imaging analysis located within FSL. And then sometime in the spring semester, I'm planning to give uh, maybe one or two more advanced workshops on other types of diffusion analysis using something called MR tricks. So for today, like I said, you know, having some <clears throat> experience with Unix is desirable, obviously. Don't worry too much if you don't really know that much about it, because what we're doing today isn't that intensive. But when we start to get into, say, MR tricks, you will need to know some more about Unix. So just a heads up. I think at this case, the general level of knowledge about Unix is relatively high. So we're not going to worry too much about that. So like I said, this workshop is a first step. Later on, next semester, 
<clears throat> we'll talk about these more advanced topics such as fiber orientation density, something called spherical deconvolution, which gets around this issue of the so-called crossing fibers problem, which we'll talk about later, as well as anatomically constrained tractography. In other words, if we start from a so-called seed region, maybe over here, and we say, what's the most likely path of a white matter fiber starting here? Well, we know that usually white matter fibers don't terminate in the ventricles, right? We know that they usually don't have like a 90 degree or greater turn all of a sudden. So we introduce these certain constraints from the nearby anatomy to try to constrain what we think would be a biologically plausible path for a given white matter tract. So those are more in the MRTRIX software package, something to look forward to next semester. So that's TBA, um, but I'd also like to combine it with what we're learning with supercomputing. Um, and we will have Charles Antonelli back in the spring, maybe once or twice, to talk about more advanced features of Flux. So my overall goal is to try to tie together some of these more advanced you know, computing resources to just bring us up to speed with some of the latest trends in imaging analysis. OK, so with that out of the way, Today's agenda is a lecture on diffusion data. What is it? How is it acquired? How is it analyzed? We're going to have a practical with a single subject from openneuro.org. That's an open access repository. And then, you know, if there's time at the very end, you know, we, if there are people who may have questions about their own data, you know, you can talk to me at the end of this workshop. So diffusion weighted imaging. Brief overview of what it is. We're all familiar with T1 weighted and T2 weighted scans. T1, T2 weighting refers to intrinsic properties of different tissue types and the relaxations of hydrogen atoms within those different tissues. So with both T1, T2 weighted, I mean, they're really two sides of the same coin. We try to hit a certain sweet spot in which the difference in intensity between the different tissues is the greatest so that we have a very clear distinction between, say, white matter, gray matter, and CSF, and really the same thing for T2-weighted. And we also use this scan protocol to acquire bold images as well, because T2-weighted is more sensitive to changes in blood oxygenation. Now we're going to be using a very similar concept with diffusion-weighted imaging. So we had T1-weighted, T2-weighted. What's going on here? Sorry, this is a little dark, but this is the outline of a brain right here. At first glance, it may look like a T2 weighted image. And technically, a certain category of diffusion weighted imaging is basically a, your typical T2 weighted functional image. But what we're interested in here isn't that typical blood oxygenation level dependent signal that we see with typical T2 weighted images. Instead, with diffusion-weighted imaging, we're trying to sensitize the data to signal loss, which may sound counterintuitive. How can signal loss be an indicator of greater or lesser diffusion? Well, just to zoom out a little bit, uh, if you've ever dissected a brain, or if you've seen it on you know, a TV show, if you ever, you probably never done this, but if you, if you did, uh, if you try to, it's a little graphic, sorry, but if you kind of like peeled it apart, right, you would notice that it has preferred tear directions. It's like string cheese, right, if you got to the, to the white matter. So that white matter, it, it, it does have preferred tear directions, right? So from that, just anatomically, we know that if we were to release some kind of diffusive material or gas or water along these white matter tracts, they would tend to go in a certain direction. Right? There may be some random variability in how they move, but the overall trend of all the molecules will be in one direction as compared to another. All right. So the uses of diffusion imaging, just to give some examples from, let's say, the uh, pathology literature, you will, at the end of this workshop, be generating things like this, these so-called tensor-fitted images. And the color codings are standardized across all software packages at this point. 
So something to memorize, and it should be obvious from the images from certain structures, but red is going to refer to left-right diffusion, primarily. Blue, it, this is corona radiata, is going to be going from bottom to top, or vice versa, just in that axis. And green is posterior to anterior, like the superior longitudinal fasciculus. And the amount, the intensity of that color refers to how strong that direction is. So for example, we can have a T2-weighted image for things like uh, edemas or abnormally enlarged ventricles or maybe some hemorrhage, something like that. And this shows up very clearly in a T2-weighted scan and also with diffusion-weighted scans as well. If there is a pool of some kind of liquid, it could be blood, it could be excess water, something like that. If there's a pocket, think of your ventricle, for example, the diffusion tends to be more or less random in all directions. And that's why you see essentially no diffusion or signal in these pockets right here, corresponding to those ventricles that you can see in the T2-weighted scan. So the history of this, again, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple equations. Really, you're not going to be interacting with them, but I want us to be on the same page when we start to talk about these tensor fittings and where they come from. <clears throat> but this is all based historically on a concept called Brownian motion, also called Brownian movement, first observed by Robert Brown in 1827. Okay. And this is pretty apparent just in everyday life if you pour, say, you know, milk into coffee, it tends to randomly diffuse, and at some point, you wait long enough, the entire liquid becomes a somewhat homogenous texture. That's because there's a random diffusion of all those molecules. But how it gets to that point, you also see these intermediate steps in which there is some random dispersion of the milk as it starts to diffuse within the coffee. This was followed up with a series of mathematical equations formalizing this. This is by Albert Einstein. Uh, one of his first really famous papers, this was around the same time as he was proposing his theories of general relativity in 1905 as part of his PhD thesis. Okay, no pressure, but that's, <laughs> that's, where, that's where he started. This was one of, they, they call it the Annus Mirabilis because in, I think in 1905 he published four it's just spectacular papers that kind of revolutionized physics. I mean, obviously, general relativity. There's also Brownian motion, which is a huge one. Uh, and there are a couple other ones as well. I, they're kind of escaping me, but they're also extremely important. Um, but he only had four papers when he graduated. And, <laughs> I mean, not to brag, but I was like three and a half or something, maybe. Publish your parents' eyes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. When he, when he came up for tenure review, they're like, you know, you know, I mean, you got a few high quality ones, but we're really looking for, for the volume. <laughs> In any case, so here's a, an, an animation of uh, what's going on with Brownian motion. And we can apply this to water diffusing through your white matter tracts as well. So think of these as water molecules, more or less drifting in random directions. And there are also other... Um, you know, say, very small particles as well in this particular figure, which tend to randomly make these other molecules diffuse in a random motion. Now, other things we can do to change the overall diffusion, we can increase the temperature, right? That increases the overall movement of all the different particles. If the temperature goes down, it slows the diffusion down. And we can also change the length of this tube or this container that we're in. And if we do that, then the diffusion is going to be, oh, sorry, uh, one more before that. You can also increase the size of different particles within this medium. Either they're bigger or they're smaller, and this can also affect the overall level and rate of diffusion. And the last thing here, yes is going to be a narrowing of the overall container, right? So again, even though there's a lot of random diffusion, on average, it's going to be going along the length of this tube. So think of this as white matter tract. 
and everything within that as water molecules, which is really what we're sensitizing our diffusion scans towards. Okay, so to tie together some of these different concepts into an equation, this is the Stokes-Einstein equation, calculating something called the diffusion coefficient d as a function of k, which is Boltzmann's constant. That's not going to change. Temperature, which can go up or down, depending on our experimental condition. Uh, eta, over here, is going to be the viscosity of the medium, and r is the spherical radius of the particles in the medium. So notice again, T is in the numerator, so if we increase it, overall diffusion is going to increase. On the bottom, if the radius or the viscosity increases, diffusion goes down. Very viscous substance such as honey, not a lot of diffusion. Something less viscous like water will increase the overall diffusion. And we apply a similar concept to diffusion weighted images. Now turning our attention more towards the neuroimaging part of it, specifically, you may notice things like b vals and b vex. If you've collected it from the scanner, this is automatically generated after the scan is complete. And what's happening during a diffusion scan, you have these so-called diffusion gradients. Now, if you took the summer course, I don't really talk about the physics that much in, in Psi 808, but when we acquire images, we have these different gradients which can vary the strength of the magnetic field based on location, right? And that's how we can rebuild these images of what the overall um, brain looks like during a functional scan. So we have a similar concept with diffusion gradients. And in this case, we have the overall magnitude of that diffusion gradient. Just keep this in mind, it'll, it'll be more apparent what these refer to when I show you an animation of this in action. You have the length of time, lowercase delta, that that gradient was turned on. And then you also have uppercase delta representing how long it takes between this diffusion gradient and then the rephasing gradient, also called uh, yeah, phasing and dephasing, I believe, are alternative names for those. So when you encounter one of these B val files, right, what, is, what does B mean? This is a mathematical term determined by, there's the gyro magnetic ratio. Okay, that's going to be a constant. You have G, that's the strength of your magnetic gradient. You have delta, how long that was turned on. And then you also have that other term over there, which is the time between this dephasing and rephasing gradient. So mathematically, that's how we construct these B vowels. And I think usually we have our own you know, uh, system or scheme of B vowels for you. You can change it if you want. This is something you do have control over in the scanner, right? <clears throat> Maybe getting a little bit far ahead of myself, but if you have multiple B values, and notice the same B value could be taken by maybe diminishing the gradient, the magnitude, but extending the length of it, or you could have a shorter duration, but a much higher gradient, right? The sum of this, the integral is going to determine your overall B. If you have multiple if you, different Bs, right? So maybe for a few scans, diffusion scans, I have something of this profile, but then some other scans, during our overall diffusion scanning session, maybe I have a longer gradient and a higher B value. If you have multiple B values, that's a so-called multi-shell approach, which you may have heard of. So whether you have two B vowels or four B vowels, those are both multi-shell acquisitions. Not shown here, if you have a B value of zero, in other words, you didn't apply any kind of dephasing gradient, that's essentially identical to a T2 weighted functional scan that you'd acquire during you know, just a, a functional run. Okay? And we, we acquire at least like one, maybe two of those as a sort of baseline image. So just having like a, a B value of zero, then maybe B values of 1,000. Okay? Usually the range is like you know, 500 to 3,000 roughly for different B values. Uh, just like zero and 1,000, 
that's not multi-shell, but if you had, you know, we kind of take zero as a given. If you had 500, then 1,000, for example, then it becomes multi-shell. It's a little difficult to explain in words, but as we go on, it should become clear. All right. Now here is another picture of what's going on during dephasing and rephasing and how these apply to diffusion. All right. <clears throat> so imagine that we have three water molecules right here. And right here, let's say that they're all in perfect phase, right? Because we're in this magnet that has a very strong magnetic field. We haven't varied it. We haven't applied any gradients at this point. But here we have a dephasing gradient okay, that applies that B val I was talking about earlier, in which case we might have a slightly weaker magnetic field here, and it gets stronger as we go from left to right. Let's keep it simple. We're looking at one plane, let's say the x-axis. So now, since the magnetic field is stronger over here, this water molecule is going to be spinning faster. Okay? We know that that property of spin is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Then if we turn off that dephasing gradient, these spins are all out of phase. Before, they were all perfectly in phase, same direction, rotating the same amount. We turn off this dephasing gradient, they're out of phase, and we know that if we collect a signal at that time, it's going to be a weaker signal than it would be if they were all in phase. If they're in phase, like their energy is summing together. When we rephase, we're applying an equal and opposite gradient that we applied here, it's just the opposite direction. Now, to the left, it's a stronger magnetic field and it becomes weaker as we move from left to right. So at the end of the rephasing gradient, assuming, and this is the critical part, assuming that the water molecules did not move at all, they will now be perfectly back in phase with each other. However, we know that the water molecules do move. And they're going to be moving at different rates depending on whether they're in a certain physical location in which they can diffuse uh, a, a, quite a lot, right, by a, a large amount. So a more realistic picture, now let's look at not three, but let's say nine water molecules to give you a sense of how much they mix together. So we apply a gradient. We dephase them, you know, and for a while they're just going to be mixing around. When we rephase them, and then we acquire another image to see how much the signal has changed. If there's been quite a bit of diffusion, then there's going to be a larger amount of signal loss. So we take that signal loss as an indicator of how much diffusion there has been. Okay, so that's the counterintuitive part, but that's how we're going to build up these diffusion-weighted images. Yeah, Violet. What, what do you mean by signal loss? Is that because the, all the like, molecules they have kind of transport like a random signal that they have to transport? Yes, the, the more that these are mixing together and being randomly interspersed, the more signal loss you're going to, to have. Okay. If, they, if there's only a little bit of movement between them, it's not going to be as large. If it's truly random, you're going to have the largest signal loss. And you're going to have the most signal loss in places like the ventricles, which aren't really that constrained. And if you look in most places in the ventricle, the water molecules are more or less diffusing at random. Like they have no constraints. Exactly, yeah. But the more narrowed and focused that a certain voxel is, or what part of the brain it is in, then um, these profiles are going to look slightly different, right? Because you'll see later on how the signal loss tends to uh, kind of change systematically along the white matter tracks as compared to, say, within the ventricles or the gray matter. So revisiting this diffusion image. So again, if we have lower signal, let's say in a region like this, which is the white matter, that indicates greater diffusion. And the way that we're going to fit this and visualize it on the brain and have a better sense of what 
where the diffusion is happening along which of the different axes, we're going to be fitting what's called a tensor. It's a three-dimensional model of the diffusion in that image. One more word about the B-valves before I move on from those. Um, they're not going to be that relevant to this workshop because with TBSS, I mean, you can still do multi-shell analysis, but it's going to be more relevant for MR tricks. But I just want you to keep this in mind. This is a pretty typical B-valve scheme, maybe a B-valve of zero. This is, again, essentially identical to a T2-weighted scan. A B-valve of 1,000. Notice how the overall signal is a little bit lower. The signal quality is a little bit noisier. And it becomes even noisier with a B value of 3,000. So higher B values are always going to have more degraded signal and be more susceptible to artifacts such as motion. You may say, well, why would we even want a really high B value anyway? If you do multi-shell analysis in something like MR tricks, it uses these characteristics of lower signal intensity, and it observes how they change differentially in different tissue types. So for example, in the white matter, if I'm going from B value of 0 to 1,000 to 3,000, the overall diminishment in signal intensity, that rate of change, is going to be different than a voxel in the gray matter or in the CSF. So when I talked about anatomically constrained you know, topography, that is what is going to give you a more kind of biologically plausible diffusion map when you recreate the white matter tracks. This is a more advanced concept, but this is the reason why you would do it. Basically, higher B values are more sensitive to differences between tissue types in diffusion, but they're also much more susceptible to artifacts. So it's, it's a trade-off. Oh, one more thing, sorry, one more thing before I move on from this. The more B values you acquire, uh, your scan is going to increase by quite a bit. Because ideally, you'd want the same amount, uh, first of all, these B, B naught or B zero scans. You might have one, two. Some people have a B value of zero maybe every like 20 or 30 images. You may see them kind of randomly interspersed. I can't say too much about that. I'm not uh, that familiar with why you would do it in that certain way. But in any case, you have relatively few B naught scans, but you would want an identical or nearly identical amount of uh, these different B valves later on. So if my scan is you know, five minutes long with just B valves of 1,000, if I included another shell, like B values of 3,000, my scan would essentially double. And I could also include B values of 2,000. Now my scan's 15 minutes long because I'm basically five minutes for each shell, if that makes sense. Again, same trade-off with fMRI data. More scan time gives you more power, but you have constraints, you have a budget, people don't like sitting still that long. So I can't give you the, the golden mean, but things to keep in mind. OK. Now, more to the point, something we will be doing today is working with these multiple b naught scans. You may notice that they have different phase encoding directions. Now, the fMRI laboratory, we can do this for you automatically if you want. We can provide you with images that have had this so-called phase encoding correction applied to it. Let me show you why this is important. So every scan, whether it's you know, your typical functional data, it could be an anatomical scan or diffusion scan, has a certain phase encoding direction. Very common ones are anterior to posterior and posterior to anterior. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think one is superior to the other. I don't know. That's really a question for the MR physicists. But in any case, most scans are in, say, one of those two. What you'll notice with the data we're working with today or your own data is you have one scan, which is really your diffusion scan. Like it's five, 10 minute scan, it has the B-valves, you know, different B-valves and so on. And it has maybe one or two um, b naught images in the A to P direction. 
And what those images will look like, this is a axial scan, is they look a little bit smeared and distorted. And depends on what kind of phase encoding direction you have. If it's anterior to posterior, it's almost like a really strong headwind on the brain and it looks like, if it's anterior to posterior, it's like the brain is smeared from here to, to the back. You'll see it on the data set we're working with. As opposed to anterior, the reverse, it's almost like the brain is smeared going forward. In other case, the data is distorted. So what happens is typically we have another very short scan. It could be just one or two B0 scans in the opposite phase encoding direction. And we combine both of them. We use something called FSLs top up to undo those distortions. So that's something I would always do. Um, Somebody here working Suan Chen, uh, Fiona. Yeah, yeah, you had the question about that. And is it, but so if you don't have those opposite phase encoded images, you won't be able to undo that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So just a, a heads up about that. Um, for those of you going forward, you know, they don't take that much time, so I, I'd always recommend it. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. <laughs> I feel like I'm calling her out, like, don't do that. But. Uh, just something to keep in mind. And it was the scan technician's fault. Yeah, the line the exactly, yes. <laughs> now I'm throwing them under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not here, so it's easy. <laughs> All right, okay, uh, let's see here. Yes. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about tensors, then I get into the practical session. <clears throat> okay. So with all of that in mind so far, we're going to use all of the data about the you know, signal loss, how much is it uh, you know, decreasing. And I talked about BVALs, but I'm also going to talk about BVEX, which is the other file that you automatically get when you acquire these diffusion images. So here's what a typical BVAL file might look like. Okay, this is single shell. This is an example of single shell. The very first volume is a B naught. Okay, so no diffusion, none of those dephasing gradients were applied. Then we have 1,000, 1,000. Basically, everything in this sequence was acquired with a BVAL of 1,000. You also have these BVEX, and these you don't have any control over during the scanning. These are going to be automatically adjusted kind of on the fly, depending on you know, the position of the subject's head and so on and so forth. But what's happening, this is a little confusing to read just you know, from the text file. But if you put this into a spreadsheet, these would be triplets of numbers along the x, y, and z directions, indicating how much the direction of that, in what direction that dephasing gradient was applied in three-dimensional space. Okay. So I can't really decode this, but it's representing it somehow. So what's happening is it's applying those in as many different directions as possible, basically. You, you might, well, you do have control over something like if you want 64 directions, for example, or 128. Usually it's in multiples of two, and powers of two, multiples of two. This will, again, use all those 64 directions with these B valves to try to sample as many different you know, different vectors in space, basically to kind of fill up a sphere in different directions, if that makes sense. So what's going to happen based on the direction of that diffusion gradient? And we can see within each voxel, because we know, you know, with the direction of these diff different diffusion gradients, how much the signal has changed. So if, for example, I happen to have a diffusion gradient that was applied it just happened to be along one of these major white matter tracts, right? Then you're going to see a lot more signal loss in that particular gradient than you would in other gradients, which gives an indication that there is a white matter tract there. There's been a lot of diffusion in that case. So these tensors, which I have in this figure up above, are designed to try to replicate or reconstruct the size and direction of these different tracks. And we do that at every different voxel. Yes? Uh, is the magnitude of BVEX 
I don't know. Yeah, the question was, is the magnitude of the bvex equal to 1? I, I don't think so. I don't think it actually sums up to anything. I could be wrong. I'm not sure. I just know that these are going to be different from subject to subject. They're subject specific. And that they indicate, it's like a three digit code basically telling exactly the direction of the um, diffusion gradient. I can see why you think it might add up to some number because it should be equal intervals along some kind of sphere yeah. along the entire head, but I can't say for sure. Basically, I don't know if there's like a check you could put in there to say that it actually did sample the entire space. Because but because at least the three first three numbers to be the oh yeah. The these three right here? Two, yeah, zero, one. Uh, it's the first zero. Uh, oh, this first one. Zero. Yeah, th this first one is, uh, yeah, so this thing is, again, kind of confusing to read because um, essentially you're getting a readout. This is like maybe the X direction for all these scans, but kind of cut off here. You would see another zero down here. For, for that very first BVAL scan, the BVEX are going to be zero, zero, zero because there's no diffusion gradient. Again, probably not going to be, I don't know if you'll be working with that really, but it, it is something to maybe keep an eye on. In this case, this very first volume, B valve zero, and all the B vex will be zero as well. So like I said before, these color codings are pretty uniform across all packages, as, as far as I can tell. I think it's standardized. Any diffusion in the x direction is going to be color coded in red. Anything in the y direction, which in our case is you know, front to back, is going to be in green. And then if we have a third dimension kind of coming out of the screen, the z dimension, uh, top to bottom, bottom to top, is going to be color coded in blue. A very common diffusion metric is called fractional anisotropy. So here's the metric for it. Think of it as like a weighted average of all three of your eigenvectors. So eigenvectors, there's a <clears throat> distinction between eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Eigenvectors represent the direction of diffusion in the x, y, and z directions. Like kind of how confident is it that it's along one of these axes. Eigenvalues is the magnitude of that diffusion. So in other words, you might have a really strong eigenvalue along, say, the x-axis, representing more preferential diffusion along that. If all the eigenvalues are kind of the same, represents more of a general diffusion without any preferred direction. So FA, fractional anisotropy, it's a weighted average of the eigenvectors. If eigenvector 1, in this case, is much greater than the other ones, that's going to lead to a higher FA value is the way to read this. And same thing for eigenvector 2 or 3. What is the E? The E? Uh, I actually forget. <laughs> I believe so. I thought I had that in my notes, but I think so, yeah. yeah. I think it represents some kind of expected value or mean. It's a good question. Yeah, I don't have that in my notes. So how do you get those eigenvectors and values? Right. Essentially, that's going to be calculated for you with the software package. That's where the heavy lifting comes in. And it should also be noted that, um, say, eigenvector 1, that always corresponds to the principal direction. It doesn't necessarily correspond to the x, y, or z axis. It detects that there's some kind of principal diffusion direction. And then that gets assigned eigenvector 1, and then 2 and 3 in descending order of how strong the diffusion is in those directions. So you get the eigenvalues and vectors for each pixel? Yes. 
So these are calculated for each voxel. And then you can create these um, whole brain maps of, say, FA values across the entire subject. Whoops. OK, so just one more animation here showing you how the tensor is constructed. So again, this is a three-dimensional model of what the diffusion is going to look like, let's say, along this white matter bundle right here. So here we have some water molecules. They're just kind of diffusing in space. They may, well, oh, I thought they were going to bump into each other, but whatever. They're just diffusing around, you know, doing their thing. And when we fit the tensor, we say, OK, how much do we need to kind of elongate this ellipsoid to best fit, let's say in this particular voxel, what the direction and the magnitude of diffusion is? So if we look at this, let me slow down here a little bit. So again, we have three eigenvectors. And the, main, the amount that we scale each of those is going to be their eigen value. And again, I've color coded them. Um, let's just say in this case, yeah, that's x axis in red, y in green, and blue for the z axis. And the amount that we scale them is going to be the eigenvalues. So eigenvectors, that's the direction of the diffusion. Eigenvalues, magnitude. And then we can use these to calculate things, not just you know, FA, for example, but also things like mean diffusivity. MD and FA are probably the two most common diffusion metrics. I'm not going to get into too much about you know, what they exactly correspond to in terms of like brain function. They're, they're, there's kind of like a, a very loose term thrown around, which is white matter integrity. There's debate about what that actually means. Okay. Obviously, there are differences in FA and MD between, say, uh, different populations, you know, especially people who might have some kind of uh, trauma to the brain. Yeah. Are three eigenvectors always orthogonal? Yes. Good point, yes. The three eigenvectors are always going to be orthogonal. So it detects that at some point there is some principal direction of diffusion. And then from that, the other eigenvectors are plotted. There are other things like uh, parent diffusion coefficient. There, there are many other things that get um, generated automatically from TPSS, but we're not going to cover all of them. Just the two most popular ones are fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity. OK, I just have a few more slides before we get into the practical part, uh, because it's also worth talking about the drawbacks of DTI. Notice, if I'm being careful with my words, you, you, you do not collect a DTI scan, right? You collect a diffusion-weighted scan. Diffusion tensor imaging is what you do afterwards. After you collect the data, you fit these tensors, which I just showed you, and then you can calculate things like FA and MD. <clears throat> but the most uh, pressing drawback of DTI is a so-called crossing fibers problem. So DTI cannot adequately model crossing fibers within a voxel. This is probably not that common in which you have two major fiber bundles crossing at perfect right angles. But it does happen sometimes, though, right, very close to it. But in any case, if we had this particular situation in which we had within a single voxel, two fiber bundles that crossed perfectly. Uh, when we fit the tensor, it would split the difference and say there's actually no preferred direction of diffusion. And it would act as though it's kind of randomly diffusing in space. But we know it's actually just these two things tend to cancel each other out if we're fitting a tensor. The underlying reality is there's actually two orthogonal fibers there. This can be mitigated with a, a more advanced technique, again, looking forward to next semester with MRTRIX, called a constrained spherical deconvolution. Similar to what you see with, decon with convolution and deconvolution with fMRI data, you know, we convolve 
some kind of instantaneous moment with that canonical HRF function. Same thing here, you know, we collect data from these diffusion scans, we might see something like this. And it could be that, yeah, there's actually just random diffusion, it's not constrained at all. But it could also be the fact that we have perfectly crossing fibers. So what will happen with something like MR tricks, it'll take data from nearby voxels to try to determine whether there's actually crossing fibers or not. And also use this spherical deconvolution approach to try to disentangle something like these crossing fibers into their uh, constituent parts. So again, we're not going to cover that here, but we will talk about it more next time. Okay, so I built in a very short break in case anybody needs to use the bathroom or any questions before we do the practical part. Or if we're good to go, we can just kind of plow ahead, maybe get done early. Okay. I think Taco Tuesday ends in eight minutes, so it's your last chance. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so let's begin with NeuroDesk. So that's how I'm going to do it. I, I recommend everybody tries it just so I get a sense of whether this will work for everybody else as well. It's NeuroDesk.org. Relatively new package. Uh, yeah, I, I, last week I talked to one of the developers, Ashley Stewart, and just found out about this. It seems relatively new, but it seems to work pretty well, so we're going to dive in and see what happens. Okay, anybody need more time to get to NeuroDesk? Okay. I don't think we're going to crash it if we all log in at the same time, but it should be robust. Uh, if it doesn't work here, then it won't work anywhere. Click on Play, and then click on US East. That's our location. It'll take a few moments, and it will start to generate this binder image. Uh, maybe take 30 seconds, I think. What's happening here is loading <clears throat> a container. It's it's segregated from your underlying operating system. So if you have a bunch of stuff installed and there might be path conflicts or different versions of Python or something, it won't affect this at all. It's its own thing. When we all use this, we're all in the exact same environment, which is one of its advantages. And click on Neuro Desktop. I'll just give you a few more seconds. Anybody need more time? Anybody not see this? Okay, click on Neuro Desktop. Excuse me. And up to you. I like dynamic resolution because it will adjust itself to my web browser. At this point, you are in NeuroDesk. You're in an instance of NeuroDesk. I believe when you exit it, it will not save whatever you've done here. So just a heads up about that. But the way it interacts with your computer is as follows. If you click in the very lower left, this icon down here, it has usual things like graphics, office, whatever. In NeuroDesk, you have access to all these different imaging packages. So I'm kind of combining two things here. I'm also going to give a brief overview of NeuroDesk. Um, let's see here. You know, within diffusion imaging, we have all these different FSL versions. Again, you can select whatever version you want. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. 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 It blew my mind. My exactly. <laughs> yes. Again, I think it's pretty new, but it seems to be stable at this point. MR tricks is there, which we'll use next time. But just for example, um, I installed a new update of uh, the Mac operating system, and you know FSL still works. Fossilize doesn't work anymore on this computer. This is maybe a year old MacBook Pro. And I'm, no, I'm really not a computer expert, but 
this removes all those issues. It's slightly slower than doing it on your own machine. Okay, think of this as like a virtual machine. But that's really the only drawback that I can really see here. Okay, so I'll leave that to you. I mean, so many things you can look at. Rodent imaging, uh, machine learning, functional imaging. It has AFNI, FSL, SPM. Only thing I want to point out is if you do use something like SPM, you'll need your own MATLAB license. So you'll need to get your license, input it to actually use MATLAB here. Same thing with FreeSurfer. You need to actually get the license before you can use something like FreeView. But otherwise, it seems to work pretty well. OK, so what I'm going to do is here I'm at Diffusion Imaging FSL. And I'm going to select the most recent version of FSL, which is 6.0.7.4. Let me increase if I can. OK. Hopefully, everybody can see that OK. So if you've used a supercomputing cluster, it's pretty much the same thing as just like loading a module. Right? We have all these different modules. You can load them. You can purge them, remove them. Same exact thing. So right now, we have access to FSL and TBSS, everything we'd need. I could, if I wanted to, just type FSL. And I have access to everything over here. All right. And then you may wonder, well, how do I actually get data into NeuroDesk? Has everybody downloaded that zip file? It's maybe 50 megabytes. It's a single subject. We're just going to do single subject today. I thought about group analysis, but it might take too long. Just single subject. So if you have that, uh, mine is on my, my desktop. It could be anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Just, just locate it. And then it's as simple as clicking and dragging into NeuroDesk. Make sure, if it's a folder, make sure it's zipped. It has to be compressed before you can move it into NeuroDesk. But once I'm here, same thing. Just double click. Uh, actually, now that. Might not be as efficient. Right click and just extract here. So now we can actually work with it. OK. And like I said, you don't have to be that fluent with Unix for this particular workshop. You can just follow along with what I'm doing. All I'm doing is going to desktop, so CD, change directory, desktop slash TBSS data. And I type ls simply to list the contents of what is here. Oh, should I should have. Yeah, I think we'll be OK for now. We might need to, for some reason, when I downloaded these individual from Open Neuro, they were a little bit different. I should have changed those. I just need to change the, the names of some of these things. It's going to be a little bit tedious, but it's OK. I think we'll survive. Um, OK. In any case, what we can do, if you have code that you already know works with FSL, what I'm going to ask you to do is go to uh, Andy's brain book, go to TBSS, slightly down the way here, and then click on Introduction to Tract-Based Spatial Statistics. And then we're going to start at chapter three, which is looking at the data. All right, so I, th I think this should work without any problems. OK, so everything in green usually is just code you can copy and paste. Only thing, because we're using a virtual machine, so you can copy this however you want. When you paste it, the code into this particular, oh, by the way, so I'm on chapter three, and I've simply copied this code right here, this FSL info, this first block of code that we see right here. So once you copy that, you're going to need to right click and then click paste. There's probably some keyboard shortcut that I haven't used yet, but just like Command V is not going to work, apparently. 
All right. So I'm bringing that up just to show. So this is a single diffusion scan. <clears throat> These different dimensions outline how many voxels there are in the x, y, z dimensions. Dimension 4 is the number of time points, which is 102. And I'm pointing that out because when you look at the BVALs, BVACs, we want to make sure that they also match up with this number of time points. Sometimes people will have some error during their pre-processing. And for some reason, in the BVAL or, or BVEC file, the very first um, B0 image isn't included. So you just need to maybe enter a 0 in there, and then you'll be fine. OK. OK, just a few minutes of tediousness. I apologize when I downloaded these. For some reason, they were saved as something a little strange. But what we're going to do, um, type MV. We need to remove some of these text extensions. Copy that. Paste it. Paste again. So this move command just means rename this file, which has that .txt extension. And call it a new file just without that txt extension. OK. And we just need to do it for the other text files as well, and also replace the subject ID. So here I'm highlighting subpath 31, acquisition AP. That's that anterior to posterior phase encoding direction. So I copy it. I paste it. Let's paste it again, change the following things. First of all, remove the .txt. And also change path 31 to con08. That's subject name. OK. Hit the up arrow to bring back the very last thing you typed. And we're going to do the same thing for the PA directions. So this is still the .bval extension. Just change AP to PA. Using the arrows to get around. Yes, and also changing the subject ID for a few of them. For some reason, they have sub you know, path 31. We're doing that for BVALs and BVEX. So you can take a look at what I've you know, written so far up here. And you should get. At the end of the day, is something that looks like this, where everything has the same subject ID. We have BVALs and BVEX for everybody. My apologies. I should have just fixed that beforehand and just uploaded that. But <clears throat> that's how it came off of Open Neural. <clears throat> and I forgot to double check it. OK. Anybody need more time to do that? All right. So for OK, I think everything else should work pretty smoothly. I'm going back to the TBSS chapter. And again, this is for you know, your own time. If you want to review in greater detail with expository text, everything we're talking about today, this module, TBSS, on my ebook will walk you through what we, what we did today with all the code on there. I'm scrolling down here to look at the BVEX and BVALS files. This isn't strictly necessary, but it's really just a check. So it uses this code called awk 
to simply list how many elements or entries there are in the BVEC and BVAL files. And like I said, the reason we did FSL info to look at things like how many volumes there were in that diffusion scan is to make sure that they're the same number of entries in the BVEC and BVAL files. So I'm going to copy that code, bring it over to NeuroDesk. Again, right click, paste, and notice the outcome from that is 102 for both of them. So if those match up, you're good to go. If they don't match up, you'll need to take a, another look, maybe ask the MR physicists or scan technicians why you're not getting the same number of entries. Because if they don't match, then the rest of it won't work. But 99% of the time, you shouldn't have an issue with that. Okay, and then we're going to use fossilize here to briefly inspect the images. <clears throat> so you can either copy that, or else it's a very simple command, just FSL eyes, followed by that <clears throat> that subconnoate AP direction DWI image. <clears throat> So again, this is good because this morning, Fossilize was not working on my laptop. No problem though, I can just look at it here. So here's a typical diffusion weighted scan. If you want to bump up the contrast, you'll see these things up here. Uh, you can change the max maybe to 1,000. It should be a little bit brighter, for example. And here's that artifact I was mentioning earlier, that anterior to posterior phase encoding direction. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to really know what it should look like unless you look at the you know, T1 weighted anatomical scan, but it is a little shortened and smushed inward from the anterior to the posterior part of the brain. So it's an artifact. Um, also, down here, this volume. So the very, it's, it starts indexed by zero, representing the very first volume in fossilized. If we click the rocker button up, Okay, so these first two images are B0 images. Some scans have two of them. Again, I don't know the details why, but it's like that in this case. Once we get to volume two and above, again, I can change this max to maybe make it a little bit brighter. Okay, like 100. So here we have the true diffusion weighted images. These have a diffusion gradient of 1,000 applied to them. In that BVAL file, it has BVALs of 1,000 for everything after the first couple of scans. So again, see how they're a little bit more degraded in quality, right? The overall intensity is a little bit lower, and you can see that the signal is quite a bit lower in what we typically consider the white matter regions. And it's like that throughout the rest of the image as well. Oh, there's another. Yeah, the intensity can change based on the strength of the BVAL. Okay, so that's really brief, quick look at the data. And if you want to see how this matches up, what should I do here? Okay, I just hit the Control Z. So I get control of this again if I type cat and this isn't strictly necessary. You can just watch what I'm doing if you want to. This dwi.bval. Oh, this is multi shell. Never mind. Okay, so the first two images are B0. Then we have 700. 2800, Yeah, that's why you see varying intensities in these different images here. Okay. Any questions so far? Just looking at the data, seeing the correspondence between the B vowels and the underlying data. Okay. Well, let's move on. I'm going back to the chapter here. It's nothing else really 
in that particular chapter. I'm going to move on to the next one to talk about how to fix some of these issues, these <clears throat> phase encoding artifacts with top up. The edit command takes quite a bit of time. We're not going to be doing that today. Uh, be aware that if you if you really want to use Eddie with its full potential, you will need a GPU. Because the most recent versions of Eddie used with more advanced packages like MRTrix, they use something called a slice to volume correction, which is very good at removing especially motion related artifacts. It's extremely computationally intensive though. If you want to use it, you probably need to use the supercomputing cluster or a really high-end computer. I, I myself do not have a GPU on this MacBook. Okay, so here, again, very typical artifacts, A to P. Notice how it's smushed from front to back, P to A. It's more smeared out at the very front. So if we want to remove that, notice we have, in this data set we're working with, we have both an AP and a PA direction image. This second file, the sub con 8 PA, it's, I think, only two volumes. They're both B not images. What we're going to do here, these two commands, FSL ROI, just copy and run it over here. Take a second to run. It extracts the very first volume of each of these images. Again, some of the details I am gliding over, and I'm just saying again that if you want to look in more detail, they are in the ebook for your perusal after the, the workshop. But these commands, this is what they're doing essentially. So we have those two images. If I type ls, notice I have ap and pa. Um, again, don't feel the need to, to go along with this, but if I looked at them in fossilize, here, ap and this. There's AP, sorry, there's uh, yeah, PA, and then AP. I'm just hiding the overlying image to show both of them. So both of them have artifacts, smearing artifacts in opposite directions. So what we're going to do, if you go back to the chapter, keep scrolling down, this next command, FSL merge, is going to combine both of them into a single file and we're going to call it AP underscore PA. So copy that. Paste. And I'm not going to look at it and fossilize, but just take it from me. It's a single image, just has both of them in one file. This next part is a little complicated. Just take it from me that these images, <clears throat> sorry, these numbers, whenever you're going to run top up, you'll need two, call, two rows of numbers. These first three index the phase encoding direction in x, y, or z directions, I believe. So no phase encoding in x direction, yes phase encoding in the y direction and from anterior to posterior, that's what a positive one means. No phase encoding in the z direction. Over here, same thing, but now in the PA direction is the phase encoding. And then this last number, it's going to differ from study to study. That is going to be your readout time. Yeah, total readout time, you can find it in uh, <clears throat> an associated JSON file. This is something you need to calculate from the scan parameters themselves. So I can't give you a single number that's going to work for everybody, but in our case, you know, we have this, which I know works with the current data set. So I'm going to copy it. Um, this is a peculiarity of, of Unix, but with our text editors, I prefer to use Nano. And I'm saying use Nano to create a new text file called acparam.txt. It's a little weird. It's a text editor within the, the terminal itself. But you can right click, you can paste, and then notice it says these different key combinations. One to write, 
out. So if I hold control and then press O, it says file name to write. Yet, yeah, no, don't do that. File name to write, yes, just hit return. And then control X will get out of nano. So again, I just pasted it. I hit control O, press enter and control X. And that's the most technical we're gonna get with, with Unix. And it, it can be a weird place. Okay, so now that we have all of our ingredients, we have this combined file, both uh, phase encoding directions. We also have our ACPRAM file, which you can read about more here. We then use this line of code here, top up. And let me, f this one will take a few minutes actually to run. So let's copy it, paste it, then I'll talk more about what it does. And press enter if you need to. Okay, <clears throat> so this command with FSL, it's called top up. It's to remove these phase encoding artifacts. So I main, the main image is that, that combined um, AP and PA image that we created from both, both phase encoding directions. Data in, so this ACK param file. Dash dash config, you may say, well, we never created this. What is this b 0 to b 0cnf This is a default file contained within the FSL library, so there's already a path to it. Top of knows where it's located and what it's called. Just think of it as a constant. I usually don't change it. In very specific situations, you may want to alter that, but I've never had to do that. Um, it just seems to work pretty well with most diffusion data with top up, so I include it as it is. And then the out is going to be this APPA underscore top up. So again, this may take a few minutes. In the last 10 minutes we have, we should have enough time to fit the tensors and take a look at it for a single subject, and that's more or less where I wanted to end today. Uh, but any questions while this thing is operating? Yeah, oh, good. Oh, I did find the shortcut. You can use Control to copy and paste, and Control Shift to copy and paste in the terminal. Just so you know. Oh, okay, okay. Because I live and die by shortcuts. That's good. Okay. So what was that again? So it's uh, so control you can copy and paste like in the general screen, but if you want to copy and paste into the terminal or paste in the terminal more likely, mm -hmm. control shift. It's basically like I think it's like most Unix or Linux machines. Control shift P. Control shift V. v. Oh, control shift V. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, nice. So okay. Uh, thank you. Here we go. Yes. Super helpful, I think. It's not it's just yeah. control shift V, yeah. yes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, learn something new every day. You taught me a lot, so I can only. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. There, <laughs> hey, yeah, lots of like things I, <laughs> lots of things I don't know. Oh, it makes my life easier. Okay, I think that should be done now for, for all of us. And the next step is actually goes by very quickly. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Again, this is kind of for your own perusal. But all of these different options are going to apply. So th that first step created this thing called a field coefficient map. Think of those as like you know, field maps for unwarping imaging data. They kind of trace out where there are problems and then apply like an equal and opposite unwarping to that. It's the same principle that's being applied here with this apply top up command. So I'm going to control shift V. Wow. OK. All right, and this should only take a few seconds and we'll take a look at the finished unwarped product. I don't think it should take that long. Yes, okay. Excellent, so the output of this is AP corrected. I call it AP core. So I still have my fossilize open. And if I now add from file AP core, you should see 
a corrected image. And if you want to compare this to what it was before, here's what PA looked like. That's what AP looked like. Okay, so just keep those in mind. Those are those um, warped images. This is the one that's been unwarped. It should look more reasonable, right? So I would always include that. So this next step of Eddy, we don't have time for it. Again, it takes a very, very long time. Uh, it, it does improve the image quality somewhat, though. There are these Eddy artifacts, which look like li little whirlpools that are very common in uh, diffusion data, but we're not going to be doing that. Um, what I will be doing, there are a couple of commands that I use for Eddy, but I also need for the next step, which is fitting the tensors. So FSL ROI, we're going to extract the first volume from this corrected time series, just because I know that that is the one that does not have any diffusion gradient applied to it, and it should have pretty good contrast to create a mask that I'm going to restrict my analysis to. So when I say mask, I mean something like this, which only has ones that include brain voxels and remove everything else. So you may notice in a figure like this, there might be some additional kind of extraneous things like could be the tongue or face, things like that, neck. It'll simply remove that. That's what the mask does. So these next two commands, I'm going to copy this FSL ROI command. Go back to my terminal. And then the next command as well, bet, that's brain extraction tool. It takes the output from this previous command and then calls the new output AP brain. This fraction parameter, that's something you can alter if, you, if you're not happy with the, the first pass. You can alter that to make the mask more conservative or not. And then again, these are just checks. You don't need to do this, but I, I do recommend it. Uh, this brain mask, AP brain mask, I can load that file and just see whether it was a good mask or not. So notice, you know, this is, you can see the underlying stuff that is now not located within this mask. It's not perfect, but it's going to work pretty well, so I'll just use it for now. Okay, we're skipping the things with Eddie, don't worry about that. Uh, we should be able to finish up the next few minutes with fitting the tensors. So really, this is the easy part. When I say fitting the tensors with DTI fit, you see some examples of what that looks like, what these are referring to. Uh, everything now is going to be done through a graphical user interface. So I'm going to go back here to my terminal. I'm going to type FSL to open up this interface with all these buttons. It's a little bit small, but you see FDT Diffusion, FSL Diffusion Toolbox. And let me expand this so we can see everything. OK, this drop down menu, it's the default prob track X. Uh, click on it and change it to DTI Reconstruct Diffusion Tensors. And then notice it says, you could, if you have things formatted in a like FSL way, you can use an input directory. Instead, I'm going to select select input files manually because I know that this will work. All right, diffusion weighted data, and each of these has a folder next to it indicating you can now select this through an interface. Excuse me. So diffusion weighted data is going to be that AP core image the data that's been corrected for the phase encoding artifacts. And notice, as soon as I select that, the output base name is automatically filled in. Yeah. It's not resizing, but that's OK. The bed binary brain mask, simply to restrict my analysis only to the mask of brain voxels and reduce processing time. So again, click on this folder and select AP Brain Mask. 
the mask created during bet. Gradient directions, those are going to be my BVEC files. What? What? <laughs> oh, oh, whoops, don't go. Not yet. Okay. We're only going to be using the AP ones. Remember, you have your kind of real diffusion image. Everything else was just for unwarping purposes. So the primary phase encoding direction is AP. That's what our analysis is going to focus on. So I select the BVEX for the AP direction. Then same thing for the B values. It's kind of annoying how I have to resize this every time, but. I still love Neurodesk. <laughs> Not going to bash it too much. Um, OK, so AP BVAL. That's our last ingredient here. And then click Go. Now, I did notice this when I was doing it myself. Um, I don't think this error actually affects anything. I'm not sure why it pops up. But just hit OK. I, I don't think that affects our actual analysis. It seems to be a quirk here. OK, so our diffusion tensor fitting has finished. Now, you can either open up fossilize again. I'm, I'm going to make this a little bit cleaner. I mean, we have everything from before. Uh, there's this minus sign. I'm just going to remove these, all these images just to make it a clean slate. Or you can open up a new F fossilize, same thing. If I go to File, Add from File, I am going to open up DTI FA. Okay, that's my fractional anisotropy images. So TBSS automatically calculated those parameters I was talking about before, FA, MD, I think a couple other things as well. So we have all of those that you could use for whole brain and for ROI analysis. One more file I'm going to add is DTI v1. DTI underscore v1 is the other image that I opened up. So this is looking a little bit more like a diffusion tensor image. Last step is go to modulate by and then click on DTI FA. So I have DTI v1 highlighted and then modulate by DTI FA. So this is our fitted tensor image, and they have their underlying FA values as well, which you can see down here. So fractional anisotropy, I don't think it goes above 1. I believe 1 is perfect, like preferential diffusion. 0 is more general diffusion, which I can test by clicking in a ventricle. FA is very low. Corpus callosum, FA is very high. So that's a, just a validation check. And notice red, again, corpus callosum goes left to right. That's in red. Something like the corona radiata is in blue. And then superior longitudinal fasciculus, which I think is around here, is in green. Uh, can you remind the, the, the direction of the colon and, and the colon? Yes, red is right to left, green is posterior to anterior, and blue is inferior to superior. So I, I check those major pathways just to make sure that the colors are actually mapped onto it correctly. I haven't really had an issue where they, they've been switched, but I check it anyway. OK, well, that was everything on my agenda today. So I gave you just conceptually what diffusion imaging is. We're working with Neurodesk, which I think is kind of a bonus, really important thing to know, because uh, it will work anywhere, anytime it should. And then we analyze a single subject, kind of start to finish, fixed a very common artifact, the face encoding artifact, fitted the tensors. And then at this point, if you had multiple subjects, again, just going back to the book, um, the next chapter would be doing a, a group level analysis if you had multiple subjects. 
And from there, you can do your typical whole brain correction. You could do ROI analysis to extract FA values from a given region. Really, it's up to you. Okay, so I think, I think that's good for today. Thank you all so much. And just be on the lookout. I don't have a, an exact date in mind, but next semester, we're going to be following up with both supercomputing and diffusion. Just, you know, filling in the gaps for things we can't fit in the normal courses.